you're carrying the gospel, you always forgive and you realize people are sinners saved by grace. So you're not looking for perfection in the world. You're looking to assist any and everybody who seeks to grow spiritually with the Lord to overcome where they are. Because no one just snaps a finger. All of a sudden, you're a saint without sin. No, you're sinners saved by grace. Your flesh is full of sin, full of bad desires and everything else. But you are the spirit that's growing up. You're being nurtured. You're being fed. That's what the Lord cares about. So anybody who shares with the spirit of the Lord is going to care about the same things he does. Jesus was not interested in turning his back on people. He was interested in man's repentance. He was interested in someone being whole. He was interested in them seeing and being healed, wasn't he? He wasn't interested in all this other stuff everybody else gets interested in. That's why he said, forgive somebody. When they said, well, how many times are we supposed to forgive a person? What was his answer? 70 times 7. Have you noticed they don't care if you talk about the Bible. They care if you begin to depict seasons. That's when they really get upset. They really care when you begin to study the New Testament. Have you noticed? Every time we've had a study in the New Testament, devils have raised their heads because they don't want people to ever bridge the gap, any gaps in your knowledge concerning Christ. They don't like that. They raise their heads. That's when people come up with this doctrinal stuff. That's when they start rumors and do all this other stuff in effort to stop it before it ever gets started. They cannot touch you, but they do threaten you. They do try to hold things over your head and everything else. They will try and ruin you if they can, but they cannot touch you. Now, it really demonstrates who the enemy really is because they only come out when you start talking about love, forgiveness, and Jesus Christ. And I'm specifically with Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're okay if you discuss the complicated patterns in the New Testament or theories in the New Testament, but if you were to ever say a simple belief in Christ is all it takes. Oh, they get angry. They pop out. You start discussing revelation and the warnings of Jesus that Jesus had to everybody. They get mad when anybody goes over the seven churches. Oh, they get angry. It stirs them. Why? These are messages of urgency. These are life giving messages. That's why when you start talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ in its simplicity, where a person can understand it, they'll lose their whole battle. If a person understands the simple love of the Father, they'll lose the war or the fight they're in. If a person were to ever finally see, yes, the Father does love me. If they were to ever see that, he's lost. And he tries to stop that from happening. It's important for you guys to remember that. The Lord allows Satan to do whatever he does. If the touch of Satan were to cause you a sickness, the Lord allowed it. Keep pressing forward. I'm telling you right now, don't stop for anything. Keep pressing on. And remember, everything with the gospel is by love, is by the choice of the other person. It is never by force. The gospel is offered. That's why Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. It never said he comes at your door, knocks it down and drags you back outside. That's not what it says. He stands at the door and he knocks. You know what that means? He waits. He waits. He waits. That's what it means. Remember all those days we were doing what we wanted to do in life? He was at the door knocking. Remember all the conviction that we had when we did something wrong? He was standing at the door knocking. Remember the time when everybody abandoned you and you thought that you were no good person because of all the... Uh, he, maybe you contemplated people you did wrong, this and the other. He never left. He was still knocking at the door. Personally, that's why I like certain people because they're down to earth. Give me a down to earth person. I don't want anybody who has their hands too clean. No, those are weak people in my book. Those are not strong people. Our hands are clean by the blood of the Lamb, which means they were filthy. Give me somebody who tangled with the devil and was victorious. Don't give me somebody who doesn't even have so much as a scratch. I don't want that either. That's a sign of weakness. Give me somebody who took the wrong path, not somebody who professes they stayed on the right path from birth. That's ridiculous. The Lord is building up a place of strength. He really is. You guys are the people of strength. See, you're the ones. You couldn't really deal. I, I noticed some of you, you found yourself in other places being trapped by discussions and you say, oh no, I can't do this. Because you, it was almost like you were getting sucked into a group of people that you realize that the Lord made, he made known to you that you don't belong to that group. You belong to his children, not some 
group, not some cult, not some place in the earth that is like a cult. And all of you recognize when somebody's trying to control me versus operating in freedom. See, a cult itself operates by the rule of force. That's how Satan operates, by the rule of force. In other words, you do it their way or they're going to talk about you. They hold a supernatural hold over your head because you feel indebted to them. You feel guilty about leaving. That's when you know you're part of a cult. You find yourself doing everything so they won't be mad at you. That's another thing about a cult. But with the Lord, everything is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Everything you do is a gift. Everything you do is a step of love. That means it's given. Christ does not obligate you to anything. That everything you do may be a gift. A gift in obedience. A gift when you love your neighbor as yourself. It's a gift. It's by choice. It's given. Never forced. These other folks want to force things. They still don't get it. Authenticity of the heart is the freedom of intention. I know that some of you, you desire to do beautiful things, but your flesh is still strong, and that's okay, because guess what? You still desire to do beautiful things. Let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus of Nazareth knows that desire, and it's that desire he sees. Your flesh reacts. Some of you get scared into doing fleshly things. The Father knows your intent. So does Christ, and with his gentle hand, he'll lift you through all sorts of turmoil and troubles. The Lord is good. But again, a type of persecution is on the way and soon to be delivered. Stay the course. Your Lord is real. Because I know I will certainly stay the course. Because I have stayed the course. And again, some of you, those of you who speak to other folks, you've been persecuted to train you, to harden you. Remember when God told Jeremiah that he was going to make his forehead as strong as their foreheads. You remember that? So that their words would not intimidate him. You remember that? So when they buried him up to his neck in some bad smelling stuff, he still stood with the Lord. With all the prophets and all they had to go through with, they stood with the Lord. They weren't forced to. They thought it in honor. Because every single time they were picked, I'm not worthy. See, when you say I'm not worthy, that means, oh, wow, that, that just blew you away. That the Creator would have you do something that blows you away. It's not that they didn't want to do it. They were highly honored and with high purpose. They did what they did. They did what they did out of love because in every case, God didn't say, go and warn them and tell them I'm going to just tear them up and blow them up. No, He conveyed His love to the prophets, to the people. And for the sake of love, the prophets went to the people begging them change. Change because thus saith the Lord. And then they would quote things. Not at all like some people would have you believe. They like control because they have no control. These evil and mean people are little bitty people who could easily be squashed, which is why they bark. Have you ever seen a little chihuahua bark his head off? Knowing that little chihuahua if somebody kicked that little chihuahua, he go flying through the air. But he barks, so nobody will try to kick him. Well, people do the same thing. A lot of people get mean and evil because someone belittled them to the point they don't want to be exploited anymore. And they are highly offended and very scared. Making to say all day they're not scared, but they're offended and scared. That's why they have that attitude, that meanness. Do you know they can still be broken free? Or whatever trance they're in, the Lord can still break them free. But I ask you this, who among you would be you? as a vessel to be kicked so that the Lord can make that change in them. If I am mistreated, neglected, whatever the case is, I'm built to take it because I can see beyond it now. When you see beyond the offenses of others, another person physically may do some harm to you because you can see beyond that physical plane of offense and anger and all these other things. You see the person for what's really going on and they're not lashing out because they're just simply mean. It's because they're fearful. Some people will kill something before it kills them, only when they're afraid of it. See, if you're not afraid of anything, you'll never lash out. Fear causes people to lash out. A fear of being hurt again. A fear of being misused again and misunderstood. A fear of not fitting in. See, if you have a fear of not fitting in, guess what you're going to do? You're going to kick a lot of people out of your life. You're going to scrutinize their lives. And the first standard you see that's not up to yours, you're going to say, I'm done with you. Once you have no more fear, once you are whole in those areas of life, you're not bothered in those areas of life. When you're doing something like this and people come at you with all sorts of attacks, it strengthens your resolve and trust in the Lord's word. 
That's what it does. You learn to depend upon the word of the Lord to resolve things because you realize that if you react, you're no better than the person who went against you. If you respond out of flesh from a person who is aggressive out of flesh, then they made you aggressive out of flesh. And now you're both on an equal plane. You're not making progress. But if you respond spiritually according to the word of God, which is the word of truth, you could potentially save a soul, help to save a soul. And what I mean by that is we know that evil people are often changed when they do something to the wrong person. And it really gets them in the heart when they learn the whole story of something. And they sit down and cry because they had no idea who they were hurting. And then later on, they find out a few facts about some things. And when they find out they were totally wrong, it'll drop a person to their knees and they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry, but now they can't because a person is gone. You guys ever see a situation like that? See somebody misuse another? Or, or think that a person is one way, but then after they're gone, they find out they were totally different, and it hurts the person who inflicted the harm so bad. They just fall to their knees and start repenting to the Lord because they messed with the wrong one. They messed with a person who was truly a good person, but they treated them like they were trash. And then later on in life, when they find out the truth, and find out facts and little things here and there. They think about that person. They say, oh, my Lord, I mistreated this person. What kind of person am I? And they drop to their knees and begin to repent. So I'm going to ask you a question the Lord asked me. Since you understand how that works, would you be that vessel somebody else would abuse? Would you be that vessel somebody else would do like that so that one day they find out the truth of you through somebody else and that soul is saved because you maintain the course even when people did not see you for who you were see the lord asked me that one day are you going to be a vessel of usage michael or are you trying to be your own vessel well naturally i understood and said yes i'll be a vessel of usage so when abuses are heaped and things are heaped upon me, which they will be, is for a reason. Or is for a reason. God will get the glory. That's not a forceful statement. That's a truthful statement because he's working in our lives. He'll get the glory because we'll be in, in such high thanks to him, knowing that only he could orchestrate something like that. See, sometimes it's rare to know what your fruit is in this world. It really is. You may sow a seed, you may water a seed. There's no guarantee you're going to see that seed grow and take off because it is God who gives the increase. God is the one who decides when it takes off from all of what it's been watered with, the soil and everything else and there's no guarantee you'll be able to see it who's going to be that vessel of usage you know because i look in nature and i start looking at simple things i can't help but to do this you look at a simple crop crop feeds people right but a crop begins with what a seed the seed does not go in a clean place the seed goes in the dirt of the earth what is the dirt it goes down with the dead things then it's trampled under foot by many things it's treated like dirt because when you plant a seed, unless you mark it, you don't know a seed is down there. It's dirt. So you waddle around in the dirt. On occasion, somebody will come around and put some water right there. But you're still surrounded by dirt. You smell like dirt. You're in the dirt. Seems like you can never break free. But then one day, the Lord says, it's time. And out of the dirt comes something that is life-sustaining. Isn't that awesome? That seed made the way it is tells of a story that's ages old. But it's just like our lives. That's a vessel of usage. Who would agree to be a seed? To be placed in the dirt for who knows how long. Until it gets the right nourishment and the right type of water, whatever the case is. To sit there until God gets ready to say grow. Who's going to be that vessel of usage to take it all? Some of you will no doubt mix this up. You're in an abusive relationship, right? Right now, you're in an abusive relationship. Listen to me carefully. You pray to the Lord to free you, but you reject it, the freedom. Don't ask the Lord for freedom if you will reject his hand. Don't do that. If you ask for freedom, do not follow guilt. Be free. And don't jump into somebody else's arm for the sake of security. Don't get free from one person. Go hunt for another because you want your securities from somebody else. Uh-uh. You're going to put yourself in double trouble there. Don't do that either. You'll find no security. You'll find a greater prison. Be free. If you think you can't handle it, 
them be free. You're not stuck in the first place. That's a mental issue. That's what you think you are. You're not stuck. But I go a bit further. If you were to pour in your house love, the Bible teaches us darkness cannot work. See, I know that for a fact, but it's hard to tell anybody that. That's something that has to be experienced. Darkness can operate where love and forgiveness is. And that must be demonstrated not by words, but by deeds. Anybody who would lay their hands on another human being, something is wrong with them spiritually. I also know that from experience. But if you forgive and allow love in, you're allowing your father in. Satan does not thrive where forgiveness is. Satan does not thrive where God's love is. See, the Bible tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. What is the definition of devil? What's the difference between devil and Satan? Anybody know the difference? The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee, that means he'll run away. Resist the devil though. It did not say resist Satan. It said resist the devil. What does that word devil mean? If we are to resist it, then who knows what it means? I study like this because I it knows. Then we have another one that says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's find out what that means, shall we? Diabolos is the Greek derivative, which comes from slander or accuser. Resist the accuser, and he will flee from you. That's why in Revelation it says, when it speaks about the dragon, it says the devil and Satan. That's why in the Old Testament you hear about Satan, that fiery flying serpent. Why would Revelation say the devil and Satan if they were both the same thing? Why use two different contextual words? So what? We, we know now that devil is a slanderer or an accuser. That's what the title is. That's a title. That's not his name. That's a title. So Satan, what would that be? Or Satanus? As people, you, what, what would Satan be? If one is slander or accuser, then what is Satan? That word Satanus, which also is a title, it is in the Kano Greek. There's a literal meaning in the Kano Greek, in the original Greek that that was written in in the first place. One of the means, it literally means the accuser. One of them is a resister of God's word. I phrase that up because it means to resist God's word. So one of them resists the word of God and one of them accuses you. Resisting God's word and the other accuses you. When Peter came up to Christ and wanted Christ to deviate from the will of God right before the crucifixion, Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, because he was resisting or did not want Christ to follow through with the given word the Father had already given him. He was resisting God's word. So Christ said, get behind me, Satan. Where the word devil is used, you're going to notice a different context by way of its usage. These things that came out of people, devils. When it jumped in a person and a person tried to resist the word of God, Satan was used. You see that? And I tell you, as a vessel of usage, you'll face both. But if you resist the accuser, he'll flee from you. That's a big part of the battle one. Because if you don't agree or give in to or interact with an accuser, suppose somebody comes in. There, there was a person that came up to me and, and I was talking to them. They said, well, you killed people before. I said, oh, yes, I did. Didn't have to deny it. After I talked some more, that was the end of that. Now, had I, because I resisted the accusation with truth, just the way Christ did. You don't lie and say, well, it was under circumstances. Don't even feed into that. With Jesus, when he responded to Satan, he used what? Scripture, the truth. Scripture is the word of truth, is it not? Jesus used scripture. He did not use his own phraseology. He used scripture. He kept saying, thus saith the Lord, or it is written. He kept using it. But if you notice, Satan was also using scripture, wasn't he? Satan uses scripture to challenge you. The bait and tackle questions, just like fishing. He'll say, well, in the Bible it says so and so. What do you think that means? We used to see that in the chat room a lot. And sure enough, true to character, those who did that with scripture ended up being bad eggs. They would challenge people with scripture to start an argument in the chat room or to, to totally pervert God's word, which I wish they wouldn't have done that, but they would do that. They can't help themselves. They operate the exact same way every single time. People can write scripture all the way, but when you challenge somebody with scripture to start an argument, you get a problem. And we used to see that all the time. But you didn't put this together. Through every single vessel, 
that blew his top in COT. They all did the exact same thing, did you notice? They would take scripture, challenge somebody by way of those scriptures, trying to make a person stumble. They did not do it to edify the body. They did not do it to esteem the other person higher than themselves. They did it to create confusion. Satan works the same way every single time. If you know his way in one thing, you'll know him in all. And the biggest clue of all in the Bible, it says when Satan speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. When he tells a lie, he speaks of his own. What is that? Because Satan is the one in the past who sowed the lie. Say, so who do you think encouraged the Sumerians? It wasn't God. It was Satan who knew Christ was coming from the beginning. And so what did he do? He led an entire generations of people in a doctrine, slowly but surely and methodically, having them document things to confuse the person of Christ when he came, when he speaks a lie, speaks of his own. Satan is the one in history and times past who sowed a bunch of things so he could utilize them today to cause doubt on the truth. He does this all throughout history. That's why most things of doubt come from fallen kingdoms. They do not come from the kingdom of God. They do not come from the word of God. They come from additional knowledge from fallen kingdoms. People bring in the Sumerian text and challenge who God was in the Old Testament. They challenge who Jesus is in the New Testament, but they're utilizing something that Satan influenced. Can't you see it? It's the same thing every single time. Now he uses academia, intellect, from the world, psychology, from the world. You know how many times I've seen a person use the definitions in behavioral sciences to describe what Jesus was doing. You can't mix the two. It won't work. I've seen people do this, and they miss the richness of the Word of God in doing so.